I'm going to try to give a talk based on URLs, if you will, because this project was really 90%, 95% of this project was done in, in my attic, which is where I do my after hours and before hours work. And it really, the story in some ways of my daughter's DNA uh, begins with naturally my daughter. Uh, and this is a recent picture of her. And unless you're a geneticist, she looks like a very cute little girl, which she is to be sure. But uh, she has a number of things, a number of clinical findings, which collected together uh, constitute a syndrome. And a syndrome is, is uh, as you probably all know, uh, comes from the word to be on the same road uh, or running together. And a, a syndrome is just a medical term uh, to, uh, to describe a collection of findings, a constellation, if you will, of stars that are generally found together. And there's some variability sometimes, but in general, these things run together. So that typically means that there's a common cause for all the things you're seeing. And she clearly has a syndrome. And at, uh, at birth, when she was born, uh, I was in the OR because she was born by a cesarean because she was the third cesarean. And it was obvious to me right away that she had something. Uh, she had very, very long feet, which by chance triggered in my own mind uh, a disease or a condition known as the Marfan syndrome, well known to me because I trained with the guy that really put the Marfan syndrome on the map. Uh, that was Dr. Victor McCusick at Hopkins, who, uh, which is where I went to medical school and did my train, my clinical training. So I saw these feet and flashed through my mind, uh, Marfan. Uh, but she also had some other things that didn't really fit into that syndrome. She had, uh, her, her fingers were contracted and she had a big port wine stain uh, on her her face, you know, uh, 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 what's called a flamus nevius. And those things are not a feature of the Marfan. So I didn't really know what she had. And she seemed perfectly fine. Her APGARs were 9 and 9, which are general measures of well-being post postnatally. So I, I just got into the swing of being a dad that day. But then right away, I decided to take her to uh, an orthopod, because it seemed to me her, her primary problem was, was orthopedic uh, with her uh, long feet and with her contracted fingers. Uh, so that really began this whole journey of trying to figure out what it was. And a lot of that was uh, shepherd, shepherding her through the whole system to find somebody who, who could actually provide me with, with some guidance. And I fully expected, to be honest with you, that somebody would say, aha, that's it. She's got this, and, and that, that would be the end of it. And the reason you want a diagnosis, and I think this audience understands this, you want a diagnosis because it often dictates a natural history, that is to say what you could expect in the future. It dictates a therapy oftentimes if there is one. Uh, and it also dictates, in some cases, who you go see. You know, there are specialists in these various things. And so all, for all those reasons, you want to know what to expect, how to treat, how to manage, and who, who's going to do that job. But just, uh, uh, you know, so that's, that's where it all began. And I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to march you through. That picture was taken by a guy named Cody Pickens, uh, who's a great guy, uh, a really uh, gifted uh, photographer in my view, <laughs> uh, notwithstanding the uh, source. So uh, this is a site that I launched really right after the SciFu talk uh, this summer, uh, mainly because somebody in the audience from The Economist uh, picked up on the story. And I, I, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that there might be some readers. And the purpose of launching my daughter's DNA.org was to, to do a few things. One was to, uh, to find other cases like my daughter. Uh, it, geneticists essentially never believe a single case. Even if you think you've really nailed the genetic cause, they just they always want to see it either mendelizing in a family, so multiple affecteds, or they want to see multiple affecteds in unrelated families who have the same genetic problem. So they never believe a single case. Uh, and it's rare anyway. So I needed to, to find other people like my daughter. And in the process, I realized that actually there's no place where 
geneticists and even highly motivated patients and families share cases that puzzle them. Those get really buried, uh, to be honest with you, I, either literally, uh, as you'll see in some cases, or, or figuratively in the sense they get a working diagnosis, which is generally a grab bag of things. And they say, well, you have something, uh, and you just get put into that. And, and usually nothing happens from that point on. So I wanted to create a forum recognizing that it might be quixotic to think that physicians would actually take the time to post cases, particularly puzzling cases, which might reveal their ignorance. What if somebody came along and said, oh, that's such and such. I've seen a million cases of those, and they're embarrassed. Or more insidious, uh, that physicians, particularly academics, kind of hoard their patients until they figure out what they have, and then they publish and get all the glory. So it may be quixotic to think that people will use it, but I pitched it at a fairly high level so that it would appeal to and not discourage physicians. And in fact, I've gotten a modest response, but the, the quality of the responses to my hypothesis and other cases has been very, very high, which is really encouraging. Uh, and we'll, I'll get back to this because this is an effort that I'm doing myself. And I have no ability to write code. So if there are people out there who are interested in helping me do things, I'd be more than delighted. And there are lots of features that I'd love to add to this that would help patients, that would help physicians, in fact, because they're almost at the same level. Physicians don't really understand genetics, and they're too busy to learn. And it's really the motivated patients and parents that I think elevate uh, genetics and integrate it into and force its integration into medical practice. I have a folder here, uh, and in here I have a picture of my daughter's fingers, and you can get a sense of, of actually what it means to have little crinkly fingers. And the, the significance of this wasn't obvious to me at first, uh, and in fact I'm not a pediatrician. I'm, I'm an adult geneticist, so I, I didn't really have to deal with this too much. Uh, it turns out the, the clinical description of this is called arthrogryposis, which is just Greek for, you know, uh, bent fingers. And the, the underlying cause is that when you're in utero, you're not extending your fingers sufficiently. And, and in fact, all your muscles uh, develop and all the, the, uh, the skin across the joints get stretched out from movement in utero. And the first question they asked my wife was, were there, were there reduced movements in, in utero, and, and the answer was, I, I don't think so. Uh, and, you know, for, for fingers, it's hard to know whether the fingers are moving, but I think this is indicative in some ways of, of actually the, the fact that her case is relatively mild, because if you have contractures across the large joints, it's actually worse. And in fact, across the large joints, she has laxity, which is a, a, was a, another clinical clue. Um, so, uh, I'll give you one other picture, and I'll just walk through a little bit about, I'm sorry, uh, about what a geneticist sees when they look at somebody's face. Uh, and, and this actually gets me to uh, another point, which is that geneticists are really the ornithologists of medicine in the sense that it's an observational science, uh, at least historically it's been. And that means that they have cataloged in great detail all the little things that, that uh, are, are normal and abnormal, like the patterns of the fingerprints or the position of the ears and things that all the rest of us don't really take much notice of. But again, as a collection of findings, they, they, can, be, uh, they can be unique and therefore named as a syndrome. And in this, this is a little bit... Um, uh, you, you might think that that's a fairly uh, typical face, and it is, but she has uh, a fairly prominent, what's called a tubular uh, nose here, a tubular uh, ridge that runs up here, and actually uh, where the frontal bones meet, there's a little ridge. It's called a metopic ridge. You can barely feel it on there, and of course nobody did for a long time. What's not apparent is that uh, her eyes are a little bit further apart. So you, now you're getting this idea that when the bones were coming together, they didn't quite fuse all the way. Um, she has a little bit of, uh, of uh, what's called hypoplasia, meaning not full growth underneath the eyes here. So her eyes are a little bit more prominent. And you may be able to appreciate that uh, her 
uh, the, the sclerae of her eyes, the whites of her eyes, are tinged blue, eggshell blue. Uh, and that, again, is something that's well known, associated with a lot of different things, but well known to be associated with general connective tissue. So just, just in her face alone, you're beginning to see four or five features that begin to define a syndrome. Uh, what I don't have a picture of, uh, but I'll show you a little bit later, is uh, the fact that if you look down her throat, you see that the little thing that hangs down in there, that little piece of flesh called the uvula, is split. And that turned out to be a, a key thing. And of course, I don't look down her throat, and uh, I didn't know to look down her throat, and nobody looked down her throat until she was about 18 months and, and saw that. In fact, in her records, it says her uvula is normal, which, which it couldn't be. So usually normal means I didn't look at it. <laughs> In, in, in medical ease. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, the Marfan, just so that uh, folks get a, get a sense of what, what that is. And in this particular case, I'm going to Wikipedia. And uh, the Marfan is, is, is a, a syndrome associated with a specific gene, a defect in a gene called fibrillin. And there, it is a syndrome. And in order to be uh, diagnosed as having the Marfan, you have to have at least three or four things in a long list of things to qualify. And there, th these criteria change over the years as, as more and more patients are seen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but one of the things that you'll notice is that they have a chest deformity. And in this case, it's sunken in, which is called excavatum, pectus excavatum. But it, it's. It can also be a pigeon breast. It just depends on which way the bones go during development. And that's, that's called pectus carinatum. And you notice the long fingers, which is very, very typical uh, of the Marfan. They also have long limbs. So they're disproportionately tall. Uh, and, they're, and their arm span and their, uh, their uh, upper body to lower body segment ratio is, is slightly altered in a, in a very stereotyped way. And, and very importantly, these patients have uh, problems with their aorta. The root of the aorta dilates. And all of these features are, are a, a, a part of the Marfan syndrome, all attributable to mutations in the fibrillin-1 gene. And when I was in medical school working with Dr. McCusick in the, in the 80s, early 80s, it was felt that the way this mutation exerted its effect was that it made a defective protein that was kinked in some way. And when it was incorporated into the connective tissue outside the cells, just the, the, the sinews, if you will, uh, because it, it was kinked, the stacking, if you will, of the various components was disrupted. And as a consequence, the tissue was weak. And with the constant beating of the heart, that the aortic root would dilate. And eventually, these patients die if not treated. They die of rupture of that aorta, generally in their 30s or 40s, and sometimes a little later, sometimes a little sooner, depending on where the mutation is. And the treatment for that today is beta blockers, which basically decreases the pounding of the heart, uh, lowers your blood pressure, and uh, a surgical repair of the aorta if that's necessary. So when I, when I was considering uh, all the things potential problems that my daughter might have. Obviously, the Marfan is way up there in my, on my list, primarily because of the aortic uh, concern. I needed to know whether she had some aortic disease. Uh, she had some of the features. She had pectus carinatum. She had uh, the, the long fingers. Her long bones were not long, uh, so that was a little bit mysterious to me. And it turns out uh, uh, she has this bifid uvula, which is not a feature of the Marfan. And in fact, the, uh, it, it turns out that when I was training with Dr. McCusick, I, I probably saw many uh, cases of, a, of another disease, uh, which is called Lowy's Dietz. And I'm not sure I, I, I have that here. Um, but Lowy's Dietz turns out to be a, a, a syndrome very, very similar to the Marfan, was confused for many years with the Marfan. The patients were all kind of lumped together. And geneticists would say, Oh, you know, that's just the variability uh, uh, that we see. But it turns out it's a separate syndrome. And that syndrome has, has the bifid uvula, 
much worse vascular disease, uh, and it turns out they have the wide eyes. So this was my source of much of the information. This was a database originally started by Dr. McKeesa called Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. And originally, it was just uh, an internal database at Hopkins that people uh, internally, uh, using the Welch Library system, um, could look at his entries. It was very idiosyncratic in that sense. Victor would get up in the morning, read the, all the journals, and type in whatever he saw. So it's very much like the original edition of the OED which is based on historical principles where uh, the first occurrence of the word in the language, uh, say in Chaucer or Sydney or Shakespeare or something was, uh, and you could see the evolution of the definition of the word and its usages. Uh, this is very similar to that unintended, uh, but it, it captures uh, the history of the description of that and the literature that supports that. And uh, the, it turns out that there was a discovery made, uh, actually an association, w which was interesting. The gene for the Marfan syndrome is fibrillin-1. That's Mutations in that gene cause the syndrome. That turned out to have a, a, a high degree of similarity to another protein called latent TGF binding protein. And essentially what that observation did was link a, path, a pathway, the TGF beta, transforming growth factor pathway, which is a hormone, with the fibrillin 1, with, with, the, with the Marfan. And that opened up a whole new way to think about what was going on in the Marfan, and indeed led to the description of this other disease as well. And all of this is happening in the last four or five years. And, and this was, it all post-dated my training and uh, my following this field very closely, but as a consequence of considering the Marfan as a, as part of the differential diagnosis of my daughter, I had to go back and read this literature and familiarize myself with it. And, it, and, and as a consequence of that, um, it became, uh, the, the, the disease that became highest on the differential list was not the Marfan, but this new syndrome called Lowy Dietz, which involved wide eyes, the bifid uvula, and the catastrophic vascular disease that you see in those patients. The average age of death is 27. So I didn't know too much about that. Two years ago, I went to Hopkins really in search of a great physical exam because I, I knew my daughter had a bunch of things and, and maybe some other things that I hadn't seen. So I wanted to take her to go see Victor and some other people at Hopkins. They were gracious. You know, they set up a clinic appointment. We go. Uh, they all come into the room, and they see B. Her, her name is Beatrice. And they're all going like this. They're all going like this. You know, and I'm saying, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Uh, they're looking down at her throat. They call some other people. They come into the room, and they're, they're all saying, yeah, that's a, yeah, well, yeah. And so it became pretty clear that uh, they had a, this conviction that she had some diagnosis that I wasn't aware of. And they hand me a paper and say, um, we published this three weeks ago. Uh, this is a collection of, of patients that we thought had the Marfan, but it turns out they have a, a mutation in a different gene, or actually two genes, um, and, and it's called Lowy's Dietz. And then the guy who handed me the paper was Lowy's, Bart Lowy's. And he said, go ahead and read this paper. And I, I knew nothing about it. Uh, and they said, we strongly urge you to get an echo. How about today? And I said, well, uh, an echocardiogram of my, of my daughter's heart. And I said, well, just by chance, I, I've already ordered one or uh, got, got one on the schedule back at UCSF. And uh, can you wait until Thursday? And they said, fine, just send us, send us a copy of the echo. And I get on the plane and come back here, and I read this paper, and I'll show you this paper. Um, it's um, it out basically it outlines the uh, this uh, this new syndrome, uh, which whoops, sorry about that. Um, uh, which essentially. It, the, all these patients were confused with the Marfan. I'm sure when I was training, I saw these patients, and we called them the Marfan and just left it at that. And what you can see is that these patients do have crumpled up fingers. Uh, they have wide eyes. Um, and they have this bifid uvula, which looks like a heart upside down. It's cleaved. And, so, and uh, again, we're talking about midline development. 
And of course, what they have is, uh, is terrible vascular disease. Th these, these kids are born, actually, with dilated aortas in some cases. Uh, in this particular paper, uh, I think one of the children had an aortic, root, aortic uh, replacement at age nine months. So I'm reading this paper, and I'm, I'm crushed, to be honest, because uh, I'm thinking, well, you know, she's got so many things that Lowy's Deeds patients have. How, how could she not have it? Uh, they, they draw some blood, and you know, they, they say, we're going to check the two genes. And these are TGF beta receptor genes. So it's all kind of making sense with respect to the pathway, uh, which gave them a clue in the first place. And uh, uh, she had her echo uh, that Thursday, and that was totally normal, uh, which was great. You know, it was a giant sigh of relief. Uh, but I still had to wait for the genes. They, they sequenced the genes. Uh, and a, a month or two later, they said they're completely normal. And uh, so I'm, I'm puzzled. They're puzzled. We're all puzzled. Uh, but the thing that really uh, was most affecting my daughter was the fact that she had muscle weakness. And muscle weakness is not even talked about in there. And if you read all the literature on the Marfan, you don't really see any discussion of muscle weakness. Uh, so I decided really to reorient my thinking about this. This is really about muscle and, and the bifid uvula and the hypertelorism. Uh, they must be, they're, they're mild compared to some of these patients. So maybe that's just a, a sideshow, if you will. And maybe I should really focus on the muscle. And so uh, I, I from that point on, I was in terra incognita because, as I said, there are no clues in the literature about the relationship between muscle disease, Lowy's Dietz, Marfan, and any of the other things. Uh, except I went back and looked at one paper uh, for a syndrome called Beals syndrome. Ron Beals orthopod in um, Portland described in 72 a group of families that looked like the Marfan. In fact, again, they were confused with the Marfan. Uh, and they had long fingers, long bones, no vascular disease in general. And, but they had puny muscles. In fact, uh, two-thirds of the patients had little bird leg-like uh, uh, legs. And I saw a picture uh, uh, in that paper, and I said, gosh, you know, bees' legs look like that, you know, little bird legs. Uh, and uh, so I wrote up the case you know, um, in a proper way. And I sent it off to Ron Beals, who I didn't know. Uh, but I said, what do you think? Uh, have you ever seen uh, so much muscle weakness in, in any of your cases and these other things? And he said, no, I, I don't think it's Beals. He calls it something else. He's, you know, <laughs> has some humility. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, that, that was it. Uh, but here's one thing that's very clear. Orthopods don't look down throats. You know, they, don't, they, don't, they look at muscles and bones and things like that, but they're not looking down throats. So there's a very real possibility to me that actually some Beals patients might have bifid uvulas, but they don't have hypertelorism. So I, again, I was kind of lost. I'm thinking, well, OK, if the Marfan is fibrillin-1, TGF-beta, TGF-beta receptors, and this constellation of findings, and Beals is fibrillin-2, a very closely related protein. And then there's a couple of black boxes. Uh, but clearly, they have to converge on the same pathway, in my view. And maybe there's something in between that regulates muscle. And that's kind of where I went on this. And so it was a little bit of a wild goose chase, uh, which I think uh, you know, is very typical, to be honest with you, of, uh, of, of this kind of thing. But I was inclined to, to do it. And, what I love more than anything else is, is generating hypotheses. So I had a friend who was the world's expert on one protein. It's a little bit like this. You know, I was the world's expert on amino acid number 452. But he, he actually was the world's expert on the whole thing. So he was in a different universe. But he had discovered a protein called myostatin. And myostatin is a protein that regulates both the number and size of muscle, it regulates the number of muscles that you develop in utero, and secondarily, once you're born, the size of them. And 
the reason it caught my attention is that it happens to be the most closely related hormone in the human genome to TGF-beta. So I'm thinking, this is starting to make sense. Um, and the other thing, the more I read about it, the receptors, which have these archaic names but totally unrelated to myostatin, actually converge on the same pathway. So TGF-beta, TGF-beta receptors, and, and they signal to the nucleus through a family of proteins called SMAD2 and SMAD3. Turns out that myostatin signals to the nucleus through SMAD2 and SMAD3. So I'm thinking, that's, that's interesting. Because maybe Beal syndrome with its defect in fibrillin 2 is filtering through the myostatin pathway, causing puny muscles. But the reason you don't see the vascular disease in those patients is because these, uh, the signals here are through a different pathway, not through smooth muscle vascular cells, but maybe just skeletal muscle. So th that's how I rationalize that. And of course, it's really hard to find that information. There is a, there is a website put up by Novartis the Research Institute that shows the distribution of all the genes and how they're expressed. But the resolution was so poor that I really couldn't get more uh, a definitive feel for whether there was a differential uh, receptor expression or whatever between the myostatin receptor and TGF-beta receptor. So what I basically decided to do was I asked my friend, would he sequence these receptors? I kind of went over this hypothesis with them, and he said, yeah, sounds reasonable to me. And if I were to start, I would start on receptor 2B, because I, I'm pretty sure that that's the business, the most important receptor for myostatin. But there, there, there are others. There's number one. Uh, and there are some other things, other receptors that glom on there, one of which is the TGF-beta receptor, which I thought was fascinating. Okay, so we're getting this convergence here. And uh, to make a very long story short, I actually had to do it myself because nobody would do it for me. And I don't know whether, that's, whether that was because everybody was polite but said, you know, really felt that the hypothesis was totally harebrained, uh, uh, or whether the, the reason some of them gave, which was, well, we can sequence it, but we can't give you the information because we're not a certified lab. And we basically can't hand over clinical information that you're going to act on. Uh, I contacted one guy who had sequenced B uh, in a group of patients. Uh, he, he uh, I think he was hiding in Montana or something because that turned out to be a spurious result. Uh, but the other two genes had never been sequenced in humans in a specific way. Obviously, they've been sequenced in the course of sequencing the human genome. But they'd never been the target of any uh, investigation, never been associated by linkage or any other method uh, with human disease. So it's kind of on my own. Uh, and really out of frustration, I just decided, you know what, I've sequenced lots of yeast genes and mouse genes and plasmids and things like that back in the Stone Ages. Why not just do it myself? And that's what I you know, was kind of forced to do. And I, I just wanted to walk you through a little bit of what that entails, uh, if you're interested. And the, it really began with going to uh, uh, the Ensemble database. I found out that the US database was actually too hard for me to use. Uh, but these were the names of the genes, um, actin, receptor 1B. There was 2 and 2A. It actually took me about a month to figure out just the nomenclature, because these genes have so many different names. The proteins were discovered by this uh, endocrinologist, and he names it uh, follicular growth factor receptor 17. Uh, somebody else finds it in, in you know, the rat, and they name it something else. So, so just to get it all straight took me a while. Uh, but I finally got it straight. And of course, the Europeans don't use the same nomenclature as the US. So uh, that made it slightly challenging. But I adopted the European method. And I focus on this gene 
uh, because this turned out to be the one of interest. Um, and here, what you get at, at this particular site is you get a menu of you know, all the things you'd like to know about this gene. Uh, for example, the exons, which are the, the portions of the gene that remain after splicing of the messenger occurs. So it's really the business end, and it's where all the protein coding regions are. Uh, and that was key to me because my model for this was the Lowy's Dietz syndrome. The Lowy's Dietz syndrome had defects in TGF beta receptor 1 and 2 with essentially identical phenotypes, suggesting that it's that just screwing up that pathway is sufficient to cause the, the disease. And all of the mutations were in one part of those two genes. It was in uh, an enzymatic portion called the kinase domain that does the signaling to SMAD2 and SMAD3. And when you can't signal, something goes amiss. And so my hypothesis was that uh, B had a defect in the kinase domain, but in this case, in the myostatin. That, that turned out not to be the case, and then probably that's a good thing, and we can talk about that. But my focus was on the protein coding regions um, originally. And uh, this gave me all of, the, all of the sequence that allowed me to then design a set of primers. And you're probably all familiar with what PCR is. But essentially, the way this works is that you, you, isolate, uh, you isolate DNA from, uh, from wherever the source is. And you design two little pieces of DNA that are complementary to opposite strands. And essentially what the reaction, the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction allows you to do is amplify, that is to say, make numerous copies, uh, identical copies, of a, of a fragment of DNA that are contained within the boundaries of those primers. Uh, it was a method discovered actually around here. Uh, and has totally revolutionized uh, the, uh, uh, the study of DNA. Uh, and uh, the, what I essentially did <clears throat> is go to the database, get the genomic sequence uh, based on uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, on what was in the database. And again, there, there's a lot of variation in the database, and they note these things. For example, this is the genomic sequence uh, pulled out. And they tell you, wherever they found an abnormality or, or a variant, that's a much better term, actually. And these variants, to be honest with you, can be sequencing errors. They can be, uh, they could be uh, uh, something that occurred in Tongans only and not in anybody else in the world. There's no annotation, so you, you don't really know. Uh, but they are noted in the database. Uh, so I, I designed a set of primers that would amplify every exon and some adjacent regions of the three genes, the ACVR1, B. There's no A for some reason. ACVR2, which doesn't have an A. And then ACVR2B. And those were the three genes. And the reason those three uh, were were used is the one and the B come together, uh, two copies of each come together and form the receptor. Uh, and you might say, well, uh, what, what if you got two different kinds of, uh, of type 2, don't you need two types of type 1? And you do. And the other one, the other type 1, is the TGF beta receptor, which had already been sequenced and told, I was told it was normal. So I, I had three others left. And uh, that's exactly what I did. Uh, essentially, to make a long story short, uh, I used the lab uh, at Stanford before I went over to Richmond and bought a bunch of used equipment, uh, which is, is cheap, actually. Everybody doesn't want a 10-year-old PCR machine. And I extracted the DNA. This is Andy Fire's lab. And he was very, very kind to let me spend the afternoon in there noodling. Uh, through uh, and extracting my DNA and my daughter's DNA. Uh, and then I ordered the primers uh, from uh, a company. Actually, I used two different sources. Uh, but but uh, I you know, essentially pulled the, uh, 
pulled the sequence out of Ensemble, and I put it into this particular, I went to this website, and they have a place where you can design oligos, Primer Quest, that was me. And here I would put in, you know, um, ACVR 1B Exxon 2. And then I would, uh, let's actually pull the sequence out if we can, uh, of, um, actually I think I'll go back here. Um, let's see, ensemble release. I'm going to pull up, I'll just show you how I actually did this. Uh, I'm going to pull up the genomic sequence and cut and paste it. So this is what it looks like in the genome. That's the first exon, the pink. I'm just going to pull that in and uh, go to IDT if I'm up here somewhere. Let's see. Uh, right here. Paste that in. And uh, going to see if it should be able to give me some primers here. And invalid entry. I'm not sure why. I see primer for scrolling messages. Um, uh, let's go back here. and tr I'm going to trim. Oh, I see. I've got some crap in there. See. Okay, that should be okay. So the annotations come with you. And it said uh, for this particular piece of DNA, uh, couldn't find any primers that met my criteria. So then I, I, I could have pre-wired this, but this is what you do. You kind of noodle through this and you say, okay, well, uh, oh, so no, here, 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 it gives me a set of primers here. Uh, and this set of primers is going to amplify the region from about 325 to maybe 525. That's the best set of primers you could find. I will go back and ask this to, to find a set of primers that are a little bit more at the ends of each of those so that I get a bigger piece of DNA so when I sequence with those two primers, I cover all of the exon in both directions. It's a belt and suspenders approach because sometimes you get a run of Gs on the top strand and the polymerase can't get through and so it's staggered and gives you a bad read. Uh, and it's really about quality control, and I don't want to have to sequence these more than once. So I actually did everything in duplicate and sequenced both strands. And I actually didn't do the physical sequencing. Uh, I, I went and priced out a, a DNA sequencer, an old slab gel system that I used to use, and they were like a thousand bucks, and I'm thinking, oh, gee. Uh, and somebody told me, well, for three dollars and fifty cents, they'll, you know, you can just send this off, and the reaction will done, and they'll send you a file back the next day. And I thought, that that sounds like what I'm going to do. Uh, so, so that's what this is what you get uh, when you do that. You get this the next day, and this is a just this is actually a sequence off of that particular gene. Uh, and what you see is, uh, you see a lot of garbage uh, on the ends. Uh, it sequences, you know, stuff. But you see there's some good sequence in there. And good sequence is defined as you have, you have single peaks here. You know, and this is C, 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 nice clean peaks. And you've got software that will actually read it. Uh, and every once in a while, you get an N there because the shoulders of the peaks overlap. And it's Ns that I'm looking for because my hypothesis is that my daughter has a single nucleotide change on one strand that would give rise to one defective receptor that could account for the dominant, likely dominant features that she has, meaning it's an autosomal dominant. That's my hypothesis. Yeah. So, so this was a mix of your DNA and your daughter's DNA? No, just hers. Just hers. But when you PCR, you, you typically don't uh, PCR a single, single chromosome. You're, you're always doing two chromosomes. So what you see is the reason you get an N on a heterozygote is because you got two strands. To, but generally, they're the same. And this is, this is very typical you know, uh, of what you see. And uh, so, so it, the, the process is about making a set of primers, seeing if they work, seeing how good they work, uh, how clean your sequence is, and, and, and looking, in my case, looking for ends. Now, I'll, I'll jump to. Uh, uh, the actual sequence that was of interest to me. Um, and that is, uh, so here, here's, here's my file. I did everything in Word because um, I actually didn't want to buy the software that allowed you to zoom through. And I just, what I did is I, I essentially uh, just said, 
find this that look like that. And uh, very, very crude, but still worked just fine. Uh, and essentially, uh, this, is, this is the, uh, this is, as you can see, this is the identification number for the sequence that came out of the EMBL database. This is the translated version, meaning the, the codons that are uh, coding for the uh, specific amino acids. This is the amino acid code here for these particular codons. Uh, I'm looking, you know, my hypothesis is that I'm looking for uh, missense mutations or possibly termination, meaning the, uh, the signal to end manufacturing the protein so that it's truncated. I'm looking for those in the kinase domain. Um, and I'm looking for a heterozygote. So that's, I, I need to be able to read this sequence very cleanly. Uh, and uh, the, it turns out the kinase domain is in the last half of the gene. Uh, the exons, these were, the, fortunately, these were small, uh, small genes. And uh, in the case of fibrillin, it has 68 or 69 exons. It is a nightmare to sequence. Th these had 10 or 11, depending on which database you believe. So I'm just paging through here the, uh, uh, the genomic sequence. You can see I've just cut and pasted it in here. And I use this as my reference. And I annotated it as I got my sequence back. And uh, I, I basically sequenced it uh, by each exon. And the, uh, the red here was the beginning of the sequence. And uh, uh, the long red here uh, were the primers that I actually developed. And you can see the primer here is, is a good deal upstream, if you will, five prime of the actual coding region for the exon in this particular case. And here's the end of the reading. Uh, so my, my sequence would begin here on this C and end on that T, but usually the first 20, 30, 40 are, are not so good uh, in terms of reading. So I need to give some breathers. And you can see the greens here are the reported variants that are, are in the database. And uh, to my surprise, uh, you know, each little file that came back, I, I looked at it at night, and it's a weird, it's a weird feeling going through this, knowing that it's your daughter's DNA, and she's, you know, it's almost as though she's patiently sitting there while you're sort of sifting through uh, to try to find things. And it, it, each, each file that came back to me after sequencing was, was, you know, it was like you're at camp and you can't wait to get this letter from your, from your girlfriend. Uh, but that to the nth power. And uh, what I did is I annotated it wherever I saw uh, a variant. I had to call B, meaning call the sequence. And in many cases, she had one or the other variant. And sometimes she was homozygous for a variant or heterozygous, as the case may be. But uh, in, uh, in one case out of, hmm, almost 20,000 base pairs of reading, she had a variant um, that was not reported. And uh, this, was, uh, this was not where I had expected to see it. Um, and uh, let me see if I can pull that up for you. B is a heterozygote disposition. OK, so this was it. This A was the A out of all these nucleotides. I mean. And it's remarkable to me, actually, how, uh, how many sequence variants were already in the database. Uh, but this one was the only one that wasn't in there. And uh, uh, this, this was my best candidate for being the cause of her syndrome. And you can see that it's. It's in the downstream region of the gene. This is not exonic or coding anymore. This is, uh, this is what we call the three prime untranslated region. And that necessitated really a different way of thinking about the problem. Because if it's not in the coding region, I'm not affecting the kinase domain. I'm probably affecting the regulation of the gene itself, most likely the amount of protein. Uh, meaning, if this particular site was a site that's recognized by part of the cellular apparatus that degrades the RNAs, maybe if it's not recognized, the level would go up. And that would throw things out of um, kilter. The most likely candidate for 
regulation would be a series of microRNAs, actually, which Andy Fire discovered, uh, that regulate mRNA. Uh, and I went to pull down the MIT software and some other software that's used to analyze that, and this did not come up as a site recognized by the canonical miRNAs. But we're in, a early, we're in the early stages of really understanding the full panoply of, of those regulatory RNAs. Um, but really, the next step was to sequence myself and my wife to see if we had an A in that position. And I, I haven't done that yet. So uh, I will do that. And of course, if we are A in that position. I you were assuming this was dominant. Yes, yes. But one of us, if, if either of us have it, uh, have that A, but we don't have the syndrome. So this has to be, I mean, my, my working hypothesis has always been that the mutation came from me, but in my germ cell. And the reason is, is I'm unaffected. I don't, I don't have any of her clinical findings, neither does my wife. And dads, particularly dads that are 45 and over, they throw off a lot of bum seed. And there is well-documented evidence that things like the Marfan, et cetera, et cetera, all the dads are older. And so I just assumed that I was the source of this. But if I have the mutation, if I have that variant, then that's probably not the cause of her problem. Yeah, so, so I have to rule that out. So the reason you can look at that mutated SNP is because you just assume that those would have been associated with some attempted syndrome? Well, I looked at every, every SNP that was in the database. Um, and this, that one particular, what I'm calling a variant, for lack of a better term, that particular A, is the only one that's not in any of the data, SNP databases. No. And in fact, most of them have no associated phenotype. Uh, but, but as I said, this particular one wasn't even in the database. This wasn't even in there. But the vast majority of SNPs, the vast majority, you probably have a million SNPs, they're not associated with anything. I mean, to, to do, unless you have a mutation that's already well known and it's not really a SNP. Uh, but we can talk about that because uh, this is the opposite kind of study where you're looking at sequencing somebody and, and capturing tons and tons of variations where they have no significance. This is very focused. And so I, I took this result to a bunch of friends. You know, I, I checked to see, well, is this region of this gene well conserved? It's primates have the identical sequence. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's highly conserved, so it's probably doing something. Uh, and most of the people I talked to said, you know, what's the probability of you predicting that there's going to be a variant in this particular gene, in this particular pathway, with this particular phenotype? It's probably it. But you, the only way to prove it, assuming that I don't have it and my wife doesn't, is to find other Beatrices, which is why I launched the site and sent out the word to people who see patients with myopathy, who might have bifid uvulas, who might have long and spidery fingers, et cetera, et cetera, to see if, and, and in fact, I went to go visit Children's Hospital in Boston. Uh, they had 850 cases of myopathy. 76 of them had no diagnosis. And I went through all 76 of those cases, and I found six that overlap with the clinical description of my daughter. So I think those patients are out there. Uh, I think the, you know, my, my kind of revised pathophysiology is if she had had a mutation in the kinase domain, she probably would have had the vascular disease. That, that's my guess. Uh, and so it's a blessing in some ways that I didn't find it in there because I think it would have been worse. Um, and to, to find it in a, a portion that regulates it just maybe throws the whole system slightly out of kilter uh, 
uh, in some ways is, is more fitting with the temperamental nature of this. This particular protein, myostatin and TGF-beta, the same way. There are at least nine levels of regulation of this protein, starting with how much of the protein is made, how quickly the RNA is degraded, the sequestration of the protein itself, all those things that hold it so that it can't touch its receptor, things that negatively regulate the receptor. It's a whole host. So the body is really trying hard to contain the activity of this pathway. And just by changing the proportion of the receptors, uh, having a little bit more uh, could disrupt it. In fact, there was a paper in Nature about maybe eight weeks ago uh, that, no, that, that was, there's another paper. <laughs> another paper about three or four uh, issues before that one showing that when you disrupt uh, the three prime untranslated region of the ACVR2B gene, that it totally disrupts the development of the African clawed toad, the Xenopus lavis uh, system. So that was exciting to me because here's an example of a regulatory portion of a gene in this pathway that has a profound developmental effect on this particular species. That, that little regulatory region is a little bit more upstream from this one, but it's conserved from man all the way down to you know, lower vertebrates. I have a question about the website and how much is focused on doctor participation and how much you've tried to get any uh, patient, you know, other parents that have kids and the doctors don't know, um, how much you try to get them involved in identifying similar, um, similar patients? Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, there probably are seven or eight cases that are posted on there now. Uh, a couple of them were from friends who had children uh, who have problems diagnosed, I mean undiagnosed. Uh, one of them is a friend of mine at Harvard, David Clapham, whose nine-year-old son died in his lap uh, from an unknown neurodegenerative disease, and I convinced him to put the case up, which was, I think, painful for him, to be honest with you, but he thought it was worthwhile. And I think it, it, it's, it's a lot of work to write up a case and to put all the, all the clinical stuff there and to know what you should include. And for example, Beatrice has, has had an elevated platelet count. You know, it's been variable, and so I haven't put that in there. But I've always thought that that might be a clue, because if the platelet count is elevated, is that the jack stat pathway that's interacting with whatever, you know? So, you know, it's hard to know what to do. But almost all the cases that have been put up there have been put up there by scientists and physicians who have children that are affected with no diagnosis. So it hasn't been, for the most part, the highly motivated parent who doesn't have a technical background. But there have been no cases so far. It's only been up there for a couple months. But there have been no cases from uh, physicians, say, at Stanford or Hopkins or wherever, who have just decided to post a case to see what kind of response. And that would be nice. That would be nice. Uh, but as I said, uh, physicians are busy. Uh, there's a proprietary nat uh, nature of, of, of patients. There is, uh, it's just not the way they think. So I think it's more going to come from parents who are working at a very high level, either because they're scientists or because they've decided to master uh, Oh, they do it. They, they do. And what's, what's really amazing to me, and I think you could say that I'm a little bit unique in the fact that I'm, you know, I know about biochemistry and I, could, I know something about medicine and et cetera. And that's true. It's a little bit of an odd convergence of, 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 of conditions here, you know, to have a daughter that doesn't have a diagnosis. But everything is out there. Really. Now, I, I have to admit that the really hard part of this was coming up with the hypothesis. That was the hard part. But I think there are ways. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, let me see if I can pull this up for you quickly. Um, uh, there are ways to facilitate that. And I, I have this chart, for example, that was made by a friend of mine. Um, 
that takes OMIM, the database that we looked at previously, and, uh, and just does a network analysis of it. And um, the, the, the point is this, that, let me see if I can make this. Um, make it bigger so you can really appreciate this. Uh, so here you've got diseases by color or presentation, like deafness is not a disease, but it's a presentation. Marfan is a diagnosis, but a presentation. And you've got the edges, or the spokes here, as genes. And what this does graphically is show you that Fibrillin 1 is, is the cause of the Marfan. It also causes isolated ectopia lentis, which is dislocation of the eye, and a feature of the Marfan. But if I were a physician and this were live, in other words, I had links here, I could actually say, I've got a patient who looks Marfanoid. What's the differential diagnosis? What are the other things that kind of look like it? Or or you know, might, might be related to it. If, if I could just make that particular graph live, it would be so much more powerful than it is just as basically eye candy right now. It's a, a, a very little use to most people other than to say, look how interconnected all the genes are and blah, blah, blah. Um, but that would help a lot, I think. Uh, just making that, uh, m m making it uh, where I could I could, uh, these would be live links. Uh, they would go to OMIM itself. They could go to Ensemble. Uh, and also, uh, the ability to put in new connections. So for example, this does not have, uh, this does not have the, five, the um, uh, TGF beta, um, TGF beta receptor two. What it does, I mean, it's receptor one. You'll, you'll see down here in the cancer, Many, many genes cause all different kinds of cancer. But here, all by itself, is low East Eats, which is colored pumpkin because it is a connective tissue disorder. But it was originally, uh, that particular de uh, gene, TGF beta receptor 2, was originally di uh, associated with colon cancer. It's going to be interesting to see if those patients actually develop that, which is another reason I'm glad she didn't have a kinase domain de defect. But TGF beta receptor 1 is not on here. So it needs to be annotated, uh, needs to be updated, needs to be live, needs to be more robust. And so that's, that answers that question. Yeah. What is the size of the number of um, I can't remember. I can't remember. I, I, I don't think it is the... I can't remember. I'll, I'll, I'll get that for you. So uh, where does that leave us? Uh, let me just finish this up and say um, that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, one, one of the things that I, I've had to do is make a di what I call a very difficult decision about actually doing something about this. And here's a a, a terrible, um, sorry, here's a terrible uh, slide that shows you a pathway, whoops, it shows you a pathway for angiotensin II. And the reason this is interesting is because this pathway, by some miracle of biochemistry, talks to TGF beta. In fact, this pathway talks to SMAD2 and SMAD3, the proteins that are activated by myostatin and by TGF beta. This was first elucidated because angiotensin II uh, is elevated in cases of hypertension. And so the angiotensin II receptor became a logical target for drugs that manage hypertension. It turns out when you give patients angiotensin II receptor antagonists, it downregulates SMAD2 and SMAD3 as a side effect, quote unquote side effect, off, you know, off target effect. Well, if you give mice, Marfan mice, 
angiotensin receptor blockers. That is to say, these are mice that are heterozygotes for a, a mutation in, mar in, in fibrillin 1. Those mice are normal. It's pretty profound. And so my daughter is on one of these drugs. And I didn't make that decision by myself, obviously. But the vascular disease of Lois Dietz and the Marfan, and that she could be at risk for vascular disease, is ineluctable. It marches forward. The aorta gets mushy. It, it dilates. It bursts. But this drug is safe. It's been in millions of people. The side effects are basically dizziness from low blood pressure, which you can titrate the dose and manage that. And so for me, just the idea of prophylacting And, and trying to minimize the risk of vascular disease outweighs the small risk that the drug poses. And in fact, I, I would add that when you look in the literature and see the patients that have taken this drug, their skeletal muscle increases in size. <laughs> and of course, the investigators who did that have no idea why that is. But I think the reason is is that it's antagonizing the myostat pathway and allowing those skeletal muscles to grow. And I'm not going to represent here that you can build up your body by taking this drug, although you might. Uh, nor am I going to say that the reason my daughter can now walk up steps is because she's been on this for seven months. But I'm not going to take her off it <laughs> unless she has a problem. You know? so, that's really why you want a diagnosis. <laughs> it's because it leads to a treatment. And even though this is considered to be controversial, all the patients who have really severe Marfan and low East Eats, they're on this drug. There's no clinical evidence yet, but they're on it. And there is a clinical trial that's being conducted. Uh, and furthermore, there was a paper showing that the muscular dystrophy mouse Totally different problem. You know, a, a, a dystrophy as opposed to a myopathy. Dystrophy is where you get degradation of the muscle, ongoing degradation and constant regeneration of the muscle trying to fix itself. Those mice do better on this drug. And it may be because TGF beta is a participant in the pathology of muscular dystrophy, or maybe that myostatin is. That's not clear. It could be both. But my feeling is that, just fortuitously, this drug will be used in a much more expanded way than was originally intended. And you know, it's just connecting all those little dots. You know, it's, <laughs> there are lots and lots of little dots in this story. And uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say that this is a conclusive uh, that I have the diagnosis. Um, or that I know why this is having a beneficial effect. Uh, but I'm a physician, and my primary charge, and as a dad as well, is to do what I can. You know, so that's, I've just done what I can. So that, I think that's the end. <laughs>